started. So welcome everybody. My name is Lisa Buffo. I'm the founder and CEO of the Cannabis Marketing Association. How many of you all are our members? If you're a member, give us a thumbs up in the chat or say hello. Yes, Erica, I will definitely reach out. There's a few of us down here. So I've, um, this is good timing, been planning a little Austin meetup. So that would be great. Nancy, good to see you. Okay, so we do these webinars uh, anywhere from two to four times a month, depending on the content we've got coming up. Um, this content is a series that we've done with Kat. So Kat is the CMO and COO of Malik's Premium Cannabis. Hi, Tony, based in Denver, even though Kat herself now lives in Seattle, Washington. We did, was anyone at our AMA last week? So last week we did an AMA in the Slack channel. For our members, if you're not in our Slack channel and you would like to be, just let us know. Emily can drop the link, but we've got a dedicated AMA channel. So Kat answered some questions you had before today's event um, about branding and brand books. Last week, we also did our branding and Brittany gather round. So we do monthly networking on, the, on Fridays, um, one of the Fridays of the month where we do one-on-one -on -one and small group sessions, and we're now theming them out where, where I am coming with statistics about certain topics. So we talked about branding in the AMA last week. I brought some stats and we talked about it in our gather round, um, our virtual networking. So for members who may be new, that's how you can uh, meet each other and connect over video. And then today's webinar is actually the how-to. It's the workshop about how to do, nice. It's the workshop about how to do and build a brand book, which Kat is going to be talking you through. So this will be recorded. So if you miss anything, don't worry. We will edit it, uh, basically just throw an intro and outro, and then we'll email it to everyone who registered. Every webinar we do is automatically emailed to all members. And then how many members have actually checked out the back end of our member portal and watched any of our webinars there? Yay, Cat has. Well, this will also be up there. So once this is edited, if you haven't already, please check out our member portal. We've got a ton of content there. So all of our webinars are recorded and uploaded. Um, we're giving the, the website a little facelift. So it's a little bit in transition, um, but we've recategorized our all of our content um, in our webinars as well. So you can go and watch them at your convenience. So if you have to leave early for whatever reason, um, or you want to see any of the other webinars that we've done, you can just sign in and watch on your own time. So we'll email you this when it's done, and then we'll upload it there, and it will live there in perpetuity. So if you have any technical issues, just shoot a message to myself or Emily. Emily Wells, our membership manager, who many of you know. And if you did an onboarding call when you joined CMA, you would have spoken with her. Um, she helps program everything, help run and produce our events. Uh, is helping be tech support on the back end. So just shoot us a message if you need anything. This We've got an hour reserved for today. So Kat's going to be talking probably about 40, 45 minutes or so. And then we'll have time, about 10, 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, these, are, these are for you. They're fairly informal. So if you've got questions as we go, just drop them in the chat. Um, we'll make sure Kat notices them. And if she's in the middle of talking, or a point, uh, we'll hold until the end, but we will definitely get to your question. So don't hesitate to speak up. Um, and again, there's no video or audio for you as attendees. So you've got to type if you need anything. Um, and I see someone's got their hand raised. I don't know if you have a question, but if you do, uh, please drop it in the chat. That's going to be the easiest way for us to connect with you. That being said, our Instagram handle is at Canna Marketing. Same on Twitter as well. Feel free to live tweet. Um, Instagram story, tag us. I will be on social as well, posting little snippets from this. So I'll reshare anything that you all um, share with us and we'll do some live tweeting as well. And Kat's Insta is at Kat Adelic. Emily, if you can copy what she said in the chat, K-A-T-A-D-E-L-L-I-C. And the brand she works for is Malix at Malix underscore premium underscore cannabis. Okay. All right, Kat, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. So I'm going to share my screen and let me know if you guys can see everything. We're good to go? Perfect. Lisa, can you let me know if we're good? Because I can only see my presentation. All good. I got you. Looks great. Everyone can see? Perfect. 
Sorry, I just wanted to double check. Awesome. So today we are going over how to build your brand book for cannabis brands and retailers. And this is really a toolkit to help you guys really implement and understand the value and importance of brand books, specifically in cannabis. I'm Catherine Wolf. I have a BS in marketing and economics from the University of Tampa and really specialized in branding. My background is working with B2B and B2C brands, really from the startup to the enterprise level across a really wide variety of industries, but really had a focus in technology, manufacturing, and hospitality. Always have been a personal cannabis user and really as kind of a, a branding geek, I would say nothing excites me more than a good brand. I was always very fascinated by branding in the cannabis industry specifically and just the unique challenges and obstacles that brands face in the space and just how essential it is to have a strong brand and, and continue to innovate. So it was always something I knew I wanted to do and made that shift to the cannabis industry in 2020. And currently I'm the chief marketing and operations officer of Malik's Premium Cannabis. We are a small batch cultivator. We do recreational products in Colorado. And this photo is actually from the Cannabis Marketing Summit where we had a table. So some of you may have seen our bright pink table and packaging. And I also do a lot of cannabis writing and consulting focused on branding. And what we're gonna be covering today are really three core areas, kind of the, brace, the basics of brand books. So really understanding what they are and how they are applicable, applicable in cannabis specifically. And then second, moving into how do you actually create and craft that brand book? And then third, which is obviously really the true key for success here is once you have that brand book, you know, you know why it's valuable and why you need it. Okay, how do you actually implement it and see that positive RRI and see those results that you're looking for from having that brand book? So first, we're going to start with those basics. So this is actually a stat from the New Frontier data report that more than 80% of cannabis marketing professionals surveyed said they were having problems getting the right message to the right audience. So how can a strong brand book actually help you bridge the gap there and make it so that there's improvements in that area? So a brand book goes by a lot of names. A brand book is what I have really always called it, but it's also referred to as a brand manual, a brand Bible, a style guide, brand guidelines. These are all different terms that you might have used or seen in different places, but really all the same thing. It's essentially the DNA blueprint of your brand. So it's one resource, one document that really compiles all of the aspects of your brand into one cohesive place. And then this book is really your go-to guide throughout all of your communication efforts. And this is one of the biggest misconceptions I see with brand books is that the content is only applicable to the marketing team. The marketing team is the only you know, department or team in the company that's using the brand book. And this really is not the case at all. There's so much value beyond that. And that is something that we're gonna dive into in a minute. So elements of a brand book. No two brands are the same, so no two brand books should be the same. No two brands are going to have the exact same elements, you know, the same look and feel, use it the same way. There really is no one size fits all approach to this, but that's a good thing because the whole point of this is to have a unique brand that's authentic to you, so you don't want it to look like somebody else's. So the elements of your brand book will really vary depending on your goals, your industry, where you are, you know, all of those things, but a lot of commonalities exist in brand books. So these are a few of them. And I group these into two buckets, verbal identity and visual identity. Verbal is really, you know, your about us story or company history, those mission and values, maybe your future vision, your messaging guidelines, tone and voice, grammar and punctuation, Links and contact info and some legal and compliance considerations are really what I see most often for cannabis brands. And then visual is really that, you know, your logos, your font, your colors, what types of photos you use, those types of things. So that is really how traditionally I would think to break it down and really focus on those two core buckets. And then we're going to get into some examples and 
brands that are doing this really well a little bit later on. So you will definitely see kind of this all brought together visually. So this is really the importance here, the value of a brand book for cannabis brands and retailers. Again, kind of linking this back to how does having a brand book help you as a cannabis brand get the right message to the right audience? You know, as a cannabis brand, we have social media pages. You might have a website. You might have, you know, menus across LeafLink and Dutchie and Weed Maps and, and various menus. You know, you have your displays in the store, you know, when customers go into a dispensary, you might do pop-ups or events and have a table or displays at things like that. So, you know, there's so many touch points that you're having with your customers and there's so many channels and mediums that we're using. And how do you communicate cohesively across all of them? You don't want someone to look at your Instagram page and then when they walk into the dispensary because they liked your Instagram page or felt a connection with your brand to go buy your product and what they're seeing and experiencing there is, is completely not aligned with what they saw about your brand online or they met a team member of yours and, and talked to them about your brand and then went to your website and it was something that completely wasn't aligned. So these are kind of the examples of why a brand book is essential to have. It really helps you communicate cohesively. So again, whether you're doing something digitally, whether you're doing something on print, whether it's your product packaging itself, whether it's how you're presenting your brand at an event, everything should go back to and connect to your brand book. And yes, this is aligned. We're using the right colors, the right logos, the right tone and voice. It also can really help you differentiate and develop that competitive advantage. Cannabis is so saturated and cannabis really is a lifestyle product you know, a lot of our customers are really connecting more with the brand and kind of that lifestyle and the experience than necessarily, you know, with a particular product itself. And having that cohesive brand and really all of those touch points, nailing it on the head, this is our brand, this is our brand, creates that memorable brand impression that will have a customer wanting to come back to you because they know and feel that connection with your brand. It also can really help on the operational side of just breaking down silos between departments, you know, marketing and sales that are working together. Also keeping all of the stakeholders that, you know, have anything to do with your brand on the same page and can really also help to avoid miscommunications or errors when you're working with people that are not internal to your company. For example, a vendor or a partner or a collaboration. And we'll get into that a little bit more on future slides as well. So your brand book can really be used, you know, I hear a lot, you put all this work together in this book, and then what do you actually do with it? How do you actually use it? Does it just sit there on the shelf and look pretty? So, you know, it really can be used during so many different processes. Anytime you're doing content creation or approval or doing that final quality control check before something is posted or shared or printed or goes live, you should really be referring to your brand book and again using it as that kind of go-to resource and guide is everything aligned is everything on brand does this make sense for where we're going as a brand it also is a really helpful tool during new employee onboarding and also new vendor onboarding so you know let's say you have someone new join your marketing team they have a go-to guide that's accurate verified with everything about your brand they could possibly need Let's say you sign on a new packaging vendor. Here are our hex codes for our colors and all of the logo usage requirements and imagery that we can use if you're gonna promote that you're working with us on social media. Also, when you're doing things like collaborations, media features and events, I personally have had situations where we've done media features and the outlet will just go online and pull a logo or maybe try and match your colors yourself and it's not on brand. This is something where if they reach out to do a media feature, you could just share your brand book and that is completely eliminated. Events, you know, we also do a lot of events where you're not always the one that's making the flyers or making the marketing assets and just being able to share that and have something that everyone can work off of together that's accurate, just really eliminates any possibilities of something going out that isn't on brand. So here's some more use cases, just diving into a little bit more, some specific examples, again, how brand books are not just for the marketing team. So internally, again, let's say a new employee joins your team. 
Maybe you have someone who works in the cultivation department and marketing and social media is not their wheelhouse at all. And they're taking pictures for you so that you have some behind the scenes imagery from the grow. Or let's say you have an employee who isn't on the marketing team and that usually isn't really part of their job role, but they're going to be at an event for you that you're not going to be at. So they're posting live stories to your social media feeds. Or maybe you have a photo and one team member is like, this is so great. I think this is really cool for our Instagram feed. And the other one is saying that they don't really think it makes sense for the brand. These are kind of all instances where you can pull out the brand book, collaborate together and really see, get to the bottom of these things and make it easier in all of these situations. And again, eliminate any chance for errors. And then again, externally, this was a big question I found in the AMA that people were asking of kind of who externally needs your brand book. So every vendor is not going to need your brand book. You know, the company that provides office supplies or, you know, maybe does your courier deliveries, if you're a cultivator, they might not necessarily need to have, you know, your brand book. But anyone who's doing anything with your packaging, anyone who would be posting about you on social media, let's say you're doing a product collaboration with another brand, again, you're participating in an event and someone else is creating the marketing assets, maybe you're vetting a potential partner for a future campaign. We actually just had this issue of looking for joint tubes and our pink color. And we have specific hex codes. So that was something that I could send out and say, are you able to, you know, provide the tubes in this color. And if they couldn't, it was something where I didn't, you know, spend more time on a vendor who couldn't align with what we needed as a brand. And now we're going to get into really how to actually create this brand book. So now we know what it can be used for, why it's so valuable for cannabis brands and retailers, a little bit more about what might be included in your brand book. And now we're going to move into some tips for actually putting this all together. So the first thing that I would always say is really to make sure you have a framework and foundation laid. And the first part of that is establishing your goals and objectives. So really you need to determine who's going to be accountable for creating, approving, and implementing your brand book. And there's a few options there that I'll get into on a later slide. Who will be using your brand book throughout the day to day? Again, who needs that? Who internally needs it? What vendors of yours need to have a copy? What do you want to get out of the brand book? Is there, you know, a problem or obstacle that you're facing in your marketing and your sales process? Are you seeing inconsistent branding between stores? Does your leaf link menu not match what's on your website menu? It doesn't match what's on your Instagram. What are these gaps? What are these problems? And how could having a a strong brand book really help you bridge those gaps? And then once you have an idea of what you want to do with the brand book, then you can decide what needs to be included in it. And the key here, I say, is to really be realistic. You'll only use your brand book if it's authentic, accurate, and applicable to your brand and your business. So think about the mediums and channels that you use, the resources and the team that you actually have, and really work backwards from there. You don't want to waste your time including pages and pages in a brand book of, you know, requirements for a platform that you don't use, or, you know, things that just are not a focus for your brand. At the same time, you always, I'd say better to be safe than sorry and include something if you think that it's valuable and you'll, you'll use it rather than leaving it out. But you don't want to, you know, have a 200 page brand book with all of these things that are really not super applicable to your brand you really wanna hone in on what is important to you. And again, this brings it back to, you might see another really awesome cannabis brand's brand book and your brand might not need all of those things in it. So just because a brand book is great or maybe is it an inspiration, you really just wanna make sure that you're actually putting the content in it that will be useful to your team and your brand. And I always say, work with your workflows of really you know the ins and outs of your brand and how your business is run and you want to make sure that your brand book is essentially going to be a resource and tool to help it improve and not something that might bog people down, if that makes sense. And then this is really the biggest piece, curating the content for your brand book. So, okay, you decide that you want to have, you know, your logo, your font, your color palette, your imagery guidelines, messaging and tone and links to all of your marketing platforms and contact info for further questions. Okay, great. So now that you have that decided, where does that content come from? 
So this is often a mix of gathering existing assets. And this also really depends on what stage you're at in your brand. If you're an up and running cannabis brand or retailer that is selling products or has a store, you likely already have a logo. You probably already have a color palette or fonts or at least something there that you could refine. So maybe you have 10 colors and you want to narrow it down to four, but you probably have a logo or you may already have some of these assets in existence. Then there might be some elements like messaging guidelines that you have not nailed down yet and you'll need to, to before you can create your brand book. In those cases, I really recommend getting insights from your own vision for the brand, how your team feels and talks about the brand, what people are saying about your brand online, what you're hearing about your brand in stores, what you're hearing about your brand at events, all of these different places and really take all of this information and refine it down to your core focus. And now we're gonna walk through a little bit of a word cloud activity example. That's something that I did when I joined the Malik's team. And again, we kind of had logos and a color palette and some of these guidelines, but it wasn't in one cohesive place. We didn't have messaging guidelines and there were definitely elements that needed to be flushed out. And this is an exercise that I did with our team that really helped. And this is something that I recommend being collaborative, getting your team together. Again, the more insights you can get, the better. Ask your friends what they think about your brand. Send a secret shopper into a store and have them take notes and see what they say. All of these different things can really help you compile these assets because, again, you want it to be accurate. You want it to be authentic. So it needs to really showcase your, who your brand really is. So this is a little exercise that's three steps of really kind of where I started the entire basis of our brand guidelines at Malik's and these messaging guidelines. So step one, kind of as we just mentioned, is really throwing it all on the wall. Everyone get in a room, get a few pieces of paper or whiteboard and throw out what words, what phrases, what things automatically come to mind or do you associate when you hear your brand name? Step two, once you kind of have that list down, is to take those things and try and group them. Either based on commonalities, like, hey, these words kind of are all describing our product and these words are kind of all describing our team or what is important to your brand. At Malik specifically, we really prioritize our values. And so that is something that, you know, most of our brand book is really focused on our, our values as a brand and how we want that to shine through our marketing and our product. So for some people, this might be more product focused. For other brands, it may be more about their values in the community, really depending on who you are as a brand, again, and what your goals and values are and what your angle in the market is. And then once you kind of can start grouping these together, you'll really want to pick the core words or phrases from each bucket that you're really gravitating to the most, that really feel most aligned with your brand. Maybe that kept coming up over and over again. And so now I'm going to show a example of how we did this at Malik. So we all got together and these were a lot of the words that came up over and over again when we were talking about our brand. So this was the initial step one word cloud. Once we had all of these words down, we really noticed that they were falling into three major buckets, our products. So as a you know premium, small batch, craft cultivator, words like elevated, quality, premium, craft, consistency, the pink, these were all words that we kind of identified with when thinking about our product. Team was another huge one for us. We do a lot of in-person events. Our team really gets out in the community. So for us, our team is just as important as our product. So we had a lot of words that were really focused on our team and that might not be the same situation for every brand. Values, as I mentioned, was a big one for us. So this is where we had a lot of words. And what we did was we kind of took one core from each of these and we ended up choosing two from values because again that is what really what is the most important to our brand and that was just something that spoke to us so this is an excerpt from our brand manual of these are the core values that we chose so we took that list of 25 words grouped them into team products and values and then chose our four key values which really 
dictate the rest of the brand book, the messaging, and how we want our brand to come across to consumers. And those words were passion, innovation, quality, and persistence. And again, these will be completely different for every brand. So now I'm going to move into how to actually implement your brand book. And putting it all together, this is really where it becomes time to ask yourself some major questions about how you want your brand book to to actually come together visually. So you have the content there. So is this something that your in-house team has the expertise and bandwidth to put together? I always say you do not need a professional designer to make a brand book. That is a major misconception. There are so many design templates available at really every level. And I have some linked at the end of this from Adobe Stock to Canva to even Google Slides, which is free for most businesses. You can find templates on there and, and you know change the colors and move things around and add your own content and make a brand book that will work for you. A lot of companies choose to work with a third, part, third party partner. That could be a marketing agency, that could be a consultant, that could be a freelancer. And if you go this route, my recommendation is really just to do your research and ensure the partner that you choose is really aligned with your values, your budget and your goals. And when working with a partner to create a brand book, it is really something that they need to put in the time and energy to really understand your brand. So if that's the route that you're going to go, I just highly recommend that you are really confident in your partner. And then sharing and distributing your brand book once it's created. My recommendation is to always have an up-to-date printed version on hand in your warehouse, in your office, in your stores, if you're a retailer, and a digital version in your Google Drive, your online folder, kind of whatever your storage system is that's clearly labeled and distributed to everyone that needs it, that it's your current up-to-date brand guidelines. I'd also recommend keeping a copy with your operating procedures, your employee handbook, really any of those other places. It can never hurt to just have a copy of your brand book with them. I also recommend to always keep archived versions. This is something that is just really cool to me to be able to look back and see how the brand has evolved and changed. And so I'd always recommend keeping previous versions and never just deleting them or working over them. But you want to make sure they're properly labeled so that you never have an issue with sending an out of date version to someone. Always keep and be sure you have access to the original file for easy edits. This is another key tip if you're working with a marketing agency or third party vendor to make sure that you have the original design file for your brand book. Let's say that marketing agency goes out of business or the employee who did it leaves the company or you no longer work with them. You just want to make sure you have the original file for your brand book. So that again, if changes need to be made, you don't have to redesign it or redo it or be chasing someone down for it. Always have the original file and make sure that's labeled as well. And then of course, make sure anyone who would need access to your brand book has it. And this is something that does not necessarily need to be a marketing expense where you're getting a physical book printed. This could be something that every vendor has a digital copy and you have you know, a printed version in your warehouse from your printer. You know, the important thing is that the content is there and you're using it and you don't want to overwhelm yourself thinking it needs to be you know, an expensive or professionally done tool. There are a lot of ways that brand books can be done in a really approachable way. And then finally, I have some implementation tips for once you have your brand book ready to go. Conducting team trainings. Again, everyone on your team should at least at the bare minimum have seen your brand book, know what's in it, and have a familiarity with it, even if they aren't involved in marketing. Whether that's, you know, when you distribute it, having everyone read it over and maybe sign a log that they've read it. And every quarter when you do updates, everyone signs the log that they've seen the most recent brand manual. You can also do trainings with your team if everyone has questions, doing mock social posts. Those things are always really helpful as well. And then I always say to proof before you post, before you click share or print or submit or go live on anything, 
you want to ask yourself, is this following the guidelines in my brand book? And it never helps there to get at least a second set of eyes and opinion on something. I always say the more, the better. And remember, it will be there forever, even if you delete it later. And this is, again, one of the really core important things of having this brand book is it's really a tool to check yourself. So if you're not really sure about something, maybe it's not on brand, maybe it's not aligned with your values as a company. The thought of, oh, I can post it and maybe if it gets a negative comment or doesn't get that many likes or we decide later it doesn't look good with the feed, we can just delete it. Those things will always be there and people will always be able to find them. So I just always say with extra caution, proof before you post and be sure that what you're putting up the first time is aligned with your brand because even if you take it down, it really is still there. And then finally is to continue to evaluate and evolve. So your brand is a living, breathing thing that evolves and changes as the industry changes, as your team changes, as cannabis changes, your brand book will do the same. So I recommend checking in quarterly. And this is something that go through your brand book, make sure everything is still aligned, make sure any necessary tweaks are made, and then be sure to distribute the new version, clearly label it and archive the old ones. And I say here, you know, your brand changes and evolves as the industry and all those things do, but you still want to remain true to yourself as a brand. And this is something I get asked a lot of like, how, like what kind of changes need to be made and how often, and it really should be making smaller tweaks. Like let's say your Instagram gets shut down. So you have a different Instagram handle. So you want to make sure that that's accurate in your brand book. Maybe you change one of the colors, a few shades or something like that, or you add some new compliance guidelines into your imagery. So it really shouldn't be anything major. It should be continuing to improve and grow. And as you notice more things, or questions that come up on behalf of your brand, putting them in there. Major changes should really be if there's a rebrand or something is really not working for your brand and you need to make a major change. But this isn't something that, you know, every quarter, every year even, you need to be completely doing a rehaul of and putting a ton of time into once you have it in a place where it is aligned with your brand and good to go, it should really be making minor tweaks from there. This is a resource bank that I put together and Lisa and Emily will share this with everyone after. There are some articles and blogs with tips and templates. There are a few template libraries. Canva is personally my favorite and what I would recommend. It's incredibly easy to use and they have some gorgeous templates, but Adobe Stock also has them. Like I said, Google Slides, really any digital design platform with templates, you can probably find something that will work for a brand book. There's also two books on there, which both are available on Amazon. One, Branding Bud, is really kind of an overview of cannabis branding and why it is so important and how you can do it effectively. And then this brand positioning workbook would be something I'd recommend, which would be really helpful for someone if you don't have those brand values nail down or your messaging guidelines or don't really know the angle that you want to take your brand book. There are some exercises in here that could really help you out. And then I have a couple of examples linked to some brand guides that I personally love. And we're going to get into some of those examples now with kind of call to what I love about them. So this is Discord's brand book. And you actually can find a lot of large companies, their brand books are online. So Spotify, McDonald's, all of these different kinds of brands. If you Google, you can often find their brand guidelines and kind of use that as a place for inspiration or help. The reason I love Discord is because it's very true to their brand. It's out of the box. It's playful. It's fun. It's not too serious. And they did a really good job of flushing out their four brand words, playful, original, reliable, and relatable. And so I think Discord just did a really good job of staying true to their brand and having a brand book that's a little bit out of the box because their brand is a little bit out of the box. Next is Slack. What I love about Slack's brand book is it's incredibly thorough and they really know who they are not. 
as much as they know who they are. So, you know, this logo misuse page that they have in their brand book is something I love because as I mentioned, I have seen our logo misused where people are pulling it for a flyer or changing the color or distorting it. And, you know, this is something where if any vendor or partner of yours had this, they would be able to clearly see how to use your logo, you know, do not crop it, do not distort it, do not put a shadow on it. So they are just incredibly thorough since their logo and brand name is so important to them to make sure it's always used correctly. They also do a great job with their voice and tone. I love how they have this, here's what we are and what we aren't. So they're very clear about where that line is. So they're confident, but they're not cocky. We're witty, but we're not silly. We're conversational, but appropriate and respectful. So you can kind of see here that they're really narrowing it down. Any Instagram caption, any website copy, any print flyer, any ad, the messaging, tone, the vibe that you're getting from the brand needs to follow these voice and tone guidelines. And it's very, very clear. Urban Outfitters is another one. I love the visual aesthetics of this brand book and how it is so aligned with their brand. This design to me looks like what I would put on a page if I walked into an Urban Outfitters store. And so I just think they did a really great job with the visual elements of this brand book. And again, really taking that experience that you have on their website, on their Instagram, in their store when you buy their clothes and bringing it to life on their brand book. Next, I have LeafLink. As I mentioned, a lot of the questions that I got was about how vendors or partners or people that are not within your own company could use your brand book and why they would need it. This is a great example of LeafLink making a brand book that's incredibly shareable and valuable to their partners. So in their brand book, they have these preset, you know, Instagram stories and posts you can use that you can download a social media kit when you get on LeafLink to announce that you're live on their site. They have these buttons that you can download and put onto your website or in your email signature that click to your LeafLink page. So they have made their brand book something that, you know, is really, again, shareable and valuable to people that are working with them. And LeafLink is one of the, I would say, more put together brand books that I've seen in cannabis specifically. And theirs is all available on their website, actually. So that is one I would definitely check out if you were looking for some inspiration or help, or if that is the type of business that you have that you might need to have shareable, downloadable assets in your brand book for partners and vendors to use. And then lastly, this is pulled from our brand guidelines at Malix. Another question I got a lot was, what kinds of compliance and legal considerations do you need to put in a brand book as a cannabis brand? Is that necessary? I would say it's definitely necessary. You'd always rather be safe than sorry when it comes to compliance. And being the CMO and COO, I have really tried to infuse the operational side into this brand book as well. And so this is a page that specifically outlines bud imagery usage guidelines. So you can see on here for us, it's really important that if we're putting a flower shot, that it's clearly taken by a professional. The photographer should always be tagged. Gloves should always be worn. If employees are visible, they need to have the proper attire with their badge visible, their hair pulled back, all of these things. So again, this is something where Let's say uh, someone in your grow takes a picture and in the background, there's someone who their hair isn't pulled back. You know, we cannot post this photo. It's not aligned with our brand guidelines. So those types of things can really help you check yourself again and ensure that something is put, isn't put up online that, you know, could be detrimental to your brand. That is something that I have seen that happen where, you know, regulating industries can see that brands are not doing things compliantly because there's not tags in their social media photos or their employees aren't wearing badges or gloves or things of that nature. So not only is this important from having a cohesive brand and showing your customers that you're compliant and you're doing things in a way that's clean and safe, but it also can actually impact your brand if you're putting things out there that are showing your brand not doing that with fines, with getting licenses taken away. So it really can actually help you from a compliance and legal standpoint 
to have all of these things in your brand book. And that really is the presentation that I had put together for you guys. This is my email address, my personal Instagram, and the brand and my phone number. If anyone has any questions beyond this, because I know we have about 15 minutes, I'm always more than happy to help. You can text me, message me on LinkedIn, call me, email me. I'm always more than happy to talk about branding and answer questions and give any advice that I can. So thank you guys, and I will open it up to questions. Thank you, Kat. That was awesome. We were, I was tweeting and Instagram storying. If you have questions, just go ahead and you can throw them right in the chat. I know there was one in the Q&A, but I got kicked off for a minute, so I don't see it. I don't know if it already got addressed, but there, there was a question in the Q&A earlier. Um, there it is. Okay, I can read it. So okay. how do you handle it when external stakeholders are bored with their branding and what want to go way off the path? I have a client with black and white branding and the CEO wants an aqua hat. I love this question. Um, I have definitely had experiences with whether it's a team member, whether it is someone external um, wanting to kind of do something that is way off the beat in branding path. And I would say, you know, it really depends. Like if you're doing a, a certain event or it's like a holiday or a certain season, or you, you know, you kind of want to do something a little bit fun. Like there are definitely cases where it's okay to go for that. And like, you know, for example, our brand is pink and teal and maybe around the holiday times we'll post things that like are green and red. Like those things obviously make sense. I would say, you know, if you, if they really want to go like way off path, I would really say why, like, what about this aqua hat? Is it, what is it saying about our brand? What is it about this color? Why does he want to do that? And I would say that answer would really kind of dictate if I would go for it or not. But I would always say, again, like you want to stick to your brand and be authentic and it's okay to do something that's fun or different or try things or test things out and see how they go. Um, but I would always color palettes and pick one for me to stick to <laughs> is my answer. And then, okay, so what is the single biggest mistake people make when it comes to branding or their brand, in your opinion? This is a big one. I would say, you know, cannabis is very competitive, very saturated, and, you know, it's a tough market. And brands at this point sometimes are kind of having to do whatever they can to survive. But, you know, you really, again, your brand is what makes you different, is what makes you special, and you really want to stay true to your brand. So the biggest mistake I would see is that people are putting things in their brand book or putting things online kind of with what they think people want to see or hear or what should be in their brand book or like what another cool brand did. And so they're going to put it in there. Um, and that just creates a huge problem because, you know, when a customer goes into the store and buys your product or you're a retailer and they go into your dispensary. And again, that experience, those visual elements, the way they're treated, the way they're talked to are not at all aligned with what they saw online, what they heard about you, what you told them, like that creates a huge problem and they'll never come back to you. Uh, so that can really ruin a relationship beyond repair if you're putting something out and then that isn't the experience that the customer has. So you really just want to make sure that you know, you're authentic, that things in your brand book are accurate, that they're aligned with what you're actually doing and saying and how you're talking to people, how you present at events, all of those things. That would really, to me, be kind of the single biggest mistake of almost people pleasing with branding, if that makes sense, um, rather than having it be true to your brand. And then you're welcome. I'm trying to see anyone has any questions, I think some might be like pushed up at the front. Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. Does anyone have, I think I answered all the ones in there. Does anyone have any other questions? I have one. Um, what is a, <laughs> what is a big mistake you've seen someone make? Like, have you ever, have you seen a mistake that's like something you, or, or maybe a story you can share of something you've done, like a lesson you've learned as far as like, Hey, we tried this and this didn't work, or we forgot to include this. And then we learned to do it later. Like any mistakes or lessons learned from your, either your own experience or something you've observed. Yeah, I would say one thing is that you really want to make sure it's a professional, professional, like can be internal or external facing document. So again, you want to keep in mind. And sometimes brands have kind of an internal version and might make a copy and remove some things or add different things as an external version. Um, but I would just say you really want to make sure it's professional and it's client facing if necessary. I have gotten brand books from brands that want to work with you or partner with you and like things are cut off or there's misspellings or like their, their own company name is spelled wrong somewhere. Or, like their own logo is incorrect or things like that. So that is kind of a, a common mistake I see with things kind of being maybe thrown together or rushed and not double checked. And you just want to make sure that it is putting your best foot forward and representing your brand in the best possible way. Everything's accurate. There are no errors. And so that is something I really see. And then again, honestly, the biggest mistake I see is not having one. You know, there are so many times, especially as a brand that hosts events and does things like that in the community, you know, we're working with other companies that it's like a struggle to get your logo for a flyer or like they can't tell us what their color palette is or like what color they want something. Um, so, so I would say really just the fact of some brands not having anything, um, you know, do what you can. Again, it, we're, it's such a tough industry. Everyone is strapped for time and resources. Even having a Google Doc, if, you, if that's how it is for you to start with, here's our logo, here's our color codes, here's our website, here's the marketing person's contact if you have questions, here are some, you know, key messaging points. Like that is better than having nothing. Um, so I would say start where you can have something that you can share with vendors and that is way better than leaving people to pull your logo online or guess or assume or grab something from somebody else. Again, start where you can. It's better to have something than nothing and build on it as you can and get it to that place where it's like your perfect brand book. It's not going to happen overnight. And if it takes you a week or three months or a year, you know, build the blocks, get those things down and continue to build and have something tangible that you can share and work off of. And that will always be better off and reduce errors and make things easier than having nothing. That makes sense. Okay. Any other questions for the group? If not, um, Emily, can you drop the events link as well as Kat's podcast episode link? So um, we did a podcast episode with Kat probably a few months back now, um, talking about her experience at Malik's and branding and um, other issues. So if you want to learn more about Kat and some of the things we have uh, talked about today further, you can check out that episode. If you want to come to our future events, we just scheduled out for the rest of the year. So we're about all wrapped up for our programming for the rest of the year. It is at the cannabis marketing association.com backslash events. And we have next month in October SEO for dispensaries, how to construct a high level strategy for Google with Jeremy Johnson from dispense. We're also going to be talking about how Delta 8 THC changed the U.S. hemp game with Madeline Scanlon from Brightfield Group. Our October theme is SEO. So our October virtual gather round is going to be SEO and salsa music. So we'll be bringing some salsa music and stats about SEO, which if any of you are in MJ Biz's uh, retail and brand newsletter, I actually wrote a little guest piece about increasing your SEO for cannabis brands that was published last week. And um, Jeremy's series. So Kat did our September series. Jeremy is part of our October series on SEO. He's also going to be doing a webinar on product-based product SEO for dispensaries. 
Um, and then lastly, in November, he's going to do one on technical SEO. So take a deep dive into that. We've got measuring your brand health in November. And then in December, I do a annual sort of state of cannabis marketing in 2022 webinar where I look at all the trends that we've seen and all the different things we've learned and kind of recap that. So those things are coming up. If you check our events page, you can register for all of that in advance. If you're on our Slack channel, we always drop the direct link. So even if you don't register, um, you should get that link and you can just join right away. And then if you're going to be at MJ BizCon, I will be speaking at their marketing forum, um, which is going to be on Tuesday. It's one of the pre-show forums, the November 15th. So if you'll be there, reach out to us. I'll be speaking. We're also going to be hosting a mixer on Thursday night. We're going to have more information and a registration link for that, as well as a new launch that we've got coming up and we've been working on since June. And I'm so excited about uh, you guys will see that in your inboxes in the next week or so. And any other questions before we wrap? We've got about five minutes. Happy to give you all some time back. But while well, we've got Kat on the line. Yes. And I put my Instagram, the brand Instagram, my LinkedIn, the website, however you want to reach me again. I am always happy to geek about some branding, answer questions, help anybody or just chat. And I also have like quite a running list of brands that inspire me, whether it's brand books or just like their brand itself on their Instagram and stuff. So if anyone is looking for inspo or some great cannabis brands to follow, reach out and I can send my list as well. And we'll send, when we send this email, we'll send that list of resources that Kat had too. So yes. you guys could look at that. And Kat, if there's any other supplementary info, just shoot it to us and we can put it all in the recap. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Okay. Thanks everybody. We'll leave the chat up for a little bit if you want to grab any of those links. Otherwise have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday. Kat, as always, thank you so much for your time and taking the time to put that together. Really, really appreciate it. And we will see you all at our next event in October. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Okay. Bye everybody.